Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our business growth lunch. My name is Lola Adibogan, and I am West Marketing and Admin Assistant. For those who are unfamiliar, Business Growth Luncheon is offered every month in partnership with the NSBA and the EDR. Each month, we cover a variety of topics, all tailored to help you in your small business. Today, our topic is Mindful Work and How to Thrive in the WSH World, presented by Kayla Kozan, founder of Peak Wellness. Thank you, Kayla, for joining us today. If you have any questions for Kayla as we go through the presentation, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box not the regular chat box. However, feel free, free to use the regular chat box to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your business. And as always, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. You'll receive an email tomorrow at this time with the link to the recording. With that, I'll pass it over to you, Kayla, to now begin the presentation. Wonderful, thank you so much for that, Lola. I'm just gonna pull up my screen here. Maybe while we're getting this set up, you could let us know in the chat where you're joining from today. There we go. I will say it is really nice anytime I have um, a Canadian audience and especially um, somewhat a Saskatchewan based audience. Um, it's so funny. Most of my our clients are in the US. And so it is one thing to tell them that you know, I'm based in Saskatchewan. It's a whole other thing to tell them I'm based in Regina. So I usually just say, you know, <laughs> I'm in the middle of Canada. I'm right above, you know, Montana, North Dakota. So it is so good to be here with you guys today. I love to see, We've got people in Regina, it looks like. Saskatoon, Saskatoon, Moose Jaw. This is a great uh, showing and I'm so thankful that you guys have made this time for yourself. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're gonna be talking about mindful work, how to thrive in a working from home world today. I know um, I see the irony um, that we are talking about Zoom fatigue on Zoom, uh, but we're gonna do the most we can to make it engaging, keep the conversation light. It is absolutely, um, a joy to be able to share this information with you guys today, as well as doing a little bit of mindfulness practices as we go along as well. So you can always hop into the chat. I love to see it. I'm going to be taking a look at it as we go along. Um, you can share your questions in the Q&A as well. Um, I don't have a hard stop at the end, so I'll be able to answer any of your questions or we can always uh, connect after the session. So thank you guys so much. Like I said, you have already done the hardest part, which is just making this time for yourself, carving out this time for yourself. And so from here, it only gets easier. I did want to do a quick check, um, just kind of getting an idea of who's in the room, seeing which one of these kind of applies to you the most. I would describe myself as a solar solopreneur. I am technically a one person company, but I have a number of freelancers and contractors that I get to work with, which is a real joy. Um, so we've got solopreneurs. I know we've got people in the room for sure that are kind of corporate by day, entrepreneurs by night students perhaps as well um, or maybe you have a side hustle this isn't your number one job right now um, but it could be down the road awesome perfect so a pretty good mix here solopreneur self-employed student i think we've got at least one of everything in here student from belgium you are probably the uh you would get the award for furthest away probably <laughs> business owners awesome Lori saying a wannabe. Lori, I'm sure any of these you could be for sure. You're in the right place for it. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you guys for hopping in here. It's so great to see. I'll give you just a quick kind of overview of the next 45 minutes we have here together. Um, we're going to be talking about stress reduction, mindfulness, meditation, self-care, why it's not selfish, as well as three self-care strategies. And then we're, like I said, going to do a couple little mini meditations as well. So the first thing we're going to start out today is called a mini meditation. I've nicknamed it a bank vault. And this is one of my favorite meditations to use to open a session like this because it just helps us arrive in the room, set um, this next 45 minutes apart from anything else that's happened earlier today, anything else that's coming up later, uh, and to really just find ourselves in this space. And so if it is your first time ever meditating, don't worry. This is super easy, super um 
quick to pick up on for beginners and there's also no right or wrong way to do it. So I'll just be leading us through it. I'm gonna have my eyes closed, but that is 100% up to you. We'll only do it for about three minutes here together. Um, yeah, this is just an opportunity to release a little bit of stress um, and bring a little bit of our intention into the time that we have together here. If feel, closing your eyes feels like a little bit much, no worries. You can also just take a soft gaze a foot or two ahead of you. And we'll begin by drawing a visualization for ourselves. So we're actually going to picture ourselves as if we were in a massive warehouse. You can imagine whatever popped up for you, whatever idea that looks like, however big it is, if it's concrete, wood, wherever you are, just this big, large, empty room. And what you notice on both sides of you, to the left and to the right, are these two massive bank vault doors. You can think of um, like what we see in the movies, like a big metal door with latches, maybe even that steering wheel type thing on there, um, locks. Again, the image that pops up into your mind, first of all, is just such a great place to start. And we'll just take a couple breaths here, building out that visualization in the greatest detail possible. And let's draw our awareness now to the left. So the bank vault that's on the left as if we were able to walk over to it. And when we look inside on the left side, all we see is anything that's happened in the past, anything that we regret, anything that we ruminate over. Why did I say that thing? Is my boss mad at me because I said this? Why did I say that thing 25 years ago? Uh, anything that's happened in the past that we can't go back and change now. And when you look inside the bank vault, it's fairly chaotic. It's a little bit stressful. There's a lot of um, rumination and worry in there. It's maybe a little bit cringeworthy when you think about these things in the past that we wish we could do over. This is a very normal, natural part of the human experience. And so just as you peek inside there, we have the opportunity now just visualizing yourself as if you're able to step outside of the bank door and pushing all your weight into the vault, all your weight into closing the door, imagining that you're able to just shut that door completely. Anything chaotic that was inside just comes to a halt. You can imagine even some of those latches and locks closing as we've locked up anything that's happened in the past that we can no longer go back and change. Maybe spinning that steering wheel so it is so tightly locked it cannot reopen. And from the left side of the room, then we'll bring our visualization over to the right so we walk all the way across the room. Peering into this bank vault on the right side, we see everything coming up in the future. Any visions we have, any worries, any anxieties, things that we don't have control over, predictions we've made that we don't know if they're gonna come true. Again, looking in here can cause just like a little bit of stress in the body, all of these things that could happen, all the worries that we hold daily. It's chaotic in there, it's messy. And noticing once again what we're able to do when we lean our body against that bank vault door, pushing it with everything we have and closing off that door into the future, any worry, anxiety. And as you slam that bank vault door closed, noticing what it feels like to sit in absolute silence, making your way back to the middle of the room. We are now in an empty room both bank vaults close. We are sitting in the present moment, which is the only moment we truly have. Noticing what it feels like to actually have some of that stress lifted off your shoulders. Maybe you feel a little bit lighter, a little bit more optimistic, a little more grounded in the room. That sense of calm wash over the body. You don't have to worry about anything that happened before this moment or anything that might happen after it finding ourselves absolutely in the present moment, noticing what that feels like in the body. This is a tool we can extend to ourselves at any time and just a little reminder that the present moment is the moment we wanna be in, the only moment we truly have. And when you're ready, you can blink your eyes back open and into the room. That is just a very simple little, um, 
we call it a mini meditation or stress reduction technique, just visualizing, um, you know, we spend a lot of time ruminating in the past uh, or worrying about the future. And so that is just an opportunity for us to close both those doors and be able to focus on the time that we have here together. That is um, a very uh, simple meditation, but it's not easy. So if this cause, uh, if this brings some like stress or you felt like this was difficult, um, that just means we're working in the right direction uh, with our kind of cognitive toolkit here. So that is something that you can continue to work on anytime you find yourself super uh, overwhelmed calling that visualization to mind. And we just keep this one in our back pocket. You'll see a lot of what we talk about today are just strategies to add to your toolkit, so to speak. So not every strategy will be the perfect fit for you. We're just finding that um, toolkit, those five or six different tools that we can use, and you'll find the best combination for yourself. So I want to thank you guys for your um, participation in that one. I will give you just a quick little overview of me, perhaps why you should listen to me at all. Um, I am back in Regina now. I grew up in Regina, but I did spend the last seven years in Toronto. Uh, I was working for a tech company there, and this is kind of my formal training in the mindfulness space, um, especially facilitating corporate mindfulness uh, courses. But this was not how I was first introduced to mindfulness. I kind of uh, was introduced to mindfulness, kicking and screaming to some extent. Um, my first introduction was called Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, and that was a tool that was presented to me by four wellness uh, or medical professionals before I took it seriously. I was working through a mental health diagnosis of my own. I had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which had me off work, um, and it was suggested to me as a supplemental therapy. And to me, it seemed way too simple to work. It didn't seem like something that could actually make a difference. Um, so if there are any skeptics in the room, I have been in the exact same place as you. And um, yeah, that was about six years ago now. And so over this time, I've been able to find the mindfulness practice that works for me, what supports me the best. Uh, and in doing so, I just found that there are a lot of people who are operating at such a high stress level, mental illness or not, that could probably, um, you know, benefit from some of these uh, different uh, techniques and tools. And I think that's where I saw that there was a market for this. Um, and so I launched the company in Toronto about two years ago now. Uh, at the same time, I was doing a little bit of um, stand-up comedy in the background so that was like uh on the back burner as a hobby of mine and um i mean we're a few minutes into the session now you might be thinking kayla you don't seem funny at all and um yeah, that's why I don't do it anymore. This is the number one uh, thing that I spend all my time doing. It is my absolute pleasure to be able to share it with you. This is my passion and my joy. So I did want to give you just a couple um um reminders or just throw some things out there as we move throughout this session. Uh, the next 50 minutes here are for you. So you've carved this time out for yourself already. Uh, and something that I'd like to remind attendees of, and especially for uh, many of us in Regina right now, Saskatchewan, uh, we're kind of, we're really struggling with uh, the pandemic and the circumstances around us. It has a lot of us working from home. Um, it has a lot of us continuing to be um, at this heightened level of anxiety and stress level. But it, I do want to remind you that um, even throughout this, it is okay to still smile and feel happy. Sometimes we might feel guilt around that. We might feel like so many bad things are happening around us. How could we feel happy right now? Um, but a reminder that in small doses, happiness, smiling, enjoying yourself, um, and giving yourself kind of that well-deserved break is healthy for it. It is what kind of fills up our cup. Uh, and a reminder that self-care is not selfish, which we're going to be looking at and talking about a lot today. One thing I like to talk about right away uh, in any session is just identify that mindfulness meditation has an image problem. And the reason I know this is true is because any organization we work with, if we ask um, the attendees, you know, close your eyes for one minute and just what image pops up to your head uh, when you think of somebody meditating, like who is this person? Where are they? And they're never in their makeshift work from home office like us they're never in like their office chair cramming in front of a screen we usually think of something like this a young woman she's on top of a mountain she has no problems at all also it seems like she has no obligations there's nothing else pulling at her time um, and perhaps if you didn't imagine her at sunrise something similar in the afternoon um, 
maybe thinking something like this uh, for yourself. And so the only problem with this view, although these people are undoubtedly meditating, is it just paints a very narrow picture of who can and who should meditate. What does it mean to meditate? What does it mean to be mindful and where we can actually fit this into our normal life? I did a similar session a couple of weeks ago and someone said that they felt like they could identify more with the moon than this guy in the picture, uh, that they'd been feeling just a little more round than usual. So uh, this is is a visualization that we can use but you don't have to feel like I don't have a mountain I don't have this outfit it's not for me so we're going to really look at different ways to be mindful throughout our day-to-day -day life it can be helpful to distinguish between mindfulness and meditation just a little bit uh, meditation is kind of that uh, picture that we just saw so that's someone in a formal practice uh, a seated practice they are focusing on a guided meditation a mantra their breath uh, sound, anything like that, kind of the formal meditation that we picture. Um, and that is just one way to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness then is kind of more of this overarching concept. Uh, all you really need to have in place to be mindful is to be paying attention to the present moment on purpose and without judgment. And so when we expand this definition, we see way more vast applications of this, um, things like in the therapeutic world, the medical world, as well as the academic world. Uh, and so a lot of the research that we see emerging now is linked to meditation or uses meditation as a base, but has stretched this into a more wide reaching um, term and practice that we have, which is mindfulness. So here are some places that you actually can be mindful. So again, kind of pushing the boundaries of what we think of as a mindfulness practice into the things that we're probably already doing. Um, so many of us, if you're anything like me, some activities are just very um, inherently mindful. So I uh, personally had not kept a plan to live my entire life until about a year ago, um, where I became like somewhat obsessed with, um, you know, having a home garden or having house plants, taking care of them. There's something interesting to do with um, kind of the combination when we think of gardening or taking care of a um, plant, and that is there is an aspect of nurturing, there's an aspect of growing something, as well as anytime we kind of separate ourselves from a computer, we're doing something with our hands, um, we're uh, playing with nature a little bit as well. Gardening is definitely a mindful activity. Any type of exercise you might do, um, so that could apply to anything like the low and slow type of exercise, something like um, distance running, distant biking, uh, walking, jogging, but actually any type of exercise, anything that takes you kind of into the present moment, that could be resistance training, that could be weight training. Um, some people will say exercise is actually the only way that they can come into the present moment. Uh, and we'll usually also have people who tell us they can not meditate. Uh, this happens, it seems to be the further up that we get in an organization. Sometimes we'll have executives tell us they can't meditate, they've tried it, there's no way they can't slow down their brain. Um, and we often recommend to them um, swimming actually. Swimming is one of the few activities you can do where you can't really worry about too much else. Uh, even if you have that monkey mind, you can't really uh, focus on anything else except not drowning in the moment. So um, exercise, swimming, um, all these different ways of moving our body is a mindfulness uh, activity in itself. Uh, we know any time that we can spend outdoors in nature, we are so lucky to be going into a warmer season uh, now, being able to, even if we bundle up, um, I know it snowed here yesterday, I'm not sure what happened in Saskatoon, um, but anytime we can spend out there, there's so many natural benefits to us being outside for both our mental and physical health. Any um, hobbies that we might have, so it's things like painting, knitting, crocheting, again, taking us into the present moment, doing something with our hands. We know spending time with children as well can be uh, mindful. Children are usually always in their present moment. They're not worried about their presentation tomorrow or why did they say this thing to their friend. Um, we can actually take a lot of cues from children and that includes our other children as well. Pets and animals are also always living in the present moment um, and spending time with them can actually kind of teleport us into the present moment as well. Most importantly now, when I think of times that mindfulness really benefits me is in times of stress uh, or frustration where otherwise it would have really kind of got to me, got under my skin. Um, and now these are things that uh, I just see as opportunities to uh, work on or challenge my mindfulness practice. Uh, and that's where I really see myself being able to kind of create this buffer between myself, my response um, and my reaction. And that just comes with time um, and can be practiced by anybody alongside your mindfulness um 
activities that you already enjoy. So I'd love to see you guys hop into the chat. I'm just asking the question, what mindful activities do you already enjoy? So some of them you might have seen on there, others that I missed. The reason I like to ask this question is because sometimes I think people think that they need to kind of create, if they're going to be someone who meditates, they need to create this new identity. They need to reinvent the wheel. They need to meditate for an hour every single day. But it's very likely that the activities that you already do and enjoy, you'll be able just to stack uh, mindfulness practices on top of those, make those a little bit uh, more mindful in themselves. So Lori is saying exercise, walking the dog, gratitude journal. Gratitude journal is such a great example. Um, Janelle working out, learning guitar, Annette setting puzzles, very therapeutic. Puzzles have come up a lot in the last year as well. I've heard it's actually even hard to get your hands on them sometimes. Um, Shayla saying swimming, great example, um, whether you knew it or not, is very much a mindful activity. Kathleen saying watching birds, I love that. There's the aspect of being outside again as well. Angela walking in the park, nature. Alexis saying meditation, yoga. Yoga is absolutely a, um, you know, a sister to meditation and a mindfulness practice, a breathwork practice. Jocelyn saying immersed in a novel, absolutely audiobooks, walking outside. These are such good examples. Thank you. And so you can see how with these practices that we already have, we already know that you're something that is beneficial to our mental and physical health. We just add a layer of mindfulness on top of that. I won't stick on this slide for too long. It is a little bit of a downer, but it is really helpful to kind of get an idea, learn a little bit more about the side effects of prolonged stress. So this doesn't, this shouldn't look like a checklist. You shouldn't have to go through each one and think, oh, I have this, I have this. Um, but what I do like to point out here is we used to think of stress as a mental concept. So stress, uh, you know, it happens in the mind. And so these side effects are also in the mind. You'll see some things here are, um, more behavioral, um, or some of them are kind of what we start to think of like linked very closely to our mental health, things like feeling depressed, um, neglect of family or work responsibilities, other things that can be more concerning over time, memory problems, difficulty concentrating. But it is worth noting as well that stress can actually manifest in a number of physical side effects as well. So things like headaches, muscle tension, muscle tension. Uh, some of these, again, being slightly more concerning, especially over time, high blood pressure, rapid heart rate, things like that. And so the silver lining of this type of breakdown of kind of the mental and the physical is that any time that we do an activity that benefits one, we're benefiting the other at the same time. We know now that the mind and the body are so infinitely linked that anything that we do to improve our mental health, improve our physical health is going to be improving the other um, and vice versa. And so this shouldn't look like a doom and gloom. Um, in fact, it should look like the opposite. Um, and we know that we have tools to improve our mental, improve our physical, and at the same time, we're usually uh, improving both sides there. We do have a lot of research in this space about um, specifically occupation burnout. So in May 2019, so this is pre-COVID, if you can imagine, even um, the World Health Organization declared occupational burnout a diagnosable condition. This was really not notable because this was the first time that the World Health Organization was saying, um, you know, we've had the idea of stress leave, stress-related in illnesses and things like that for a long time. But this was the World Health Organization saying specifically the work that you do as your job or your occupation, creating burnout and creating burnout at a medical um, level. And so this, I think, opens up a lot of questions around um, what is reasonable um, to be attached to your occupation, what is a reasonable amount of stress, and then what is by far exceeding that and kind of pushing that type of boundary. Um, and so very, very interesting shift to see in this space. And I think employers starting to take a closer look at this as well. We also know one in five individuals will personally experience a mental health problem or illness within any given year. This again was a stat for pre-COVID. This number is expected to be higher right now. Um, and I think when we expand the definition to not just be the individual who's impacted by stress um, or mental illness, but you know, if you expand the definition to say a friend, a colleague, a family member, a coworker, very quickly this definition becomes five and five of us are um, impacted by mental illness in any given year. 
And then we also have a little bit of research that has emerged since um, most of us have moved to working from home. So the workday, uh, although there was a lot of optimism around shorter workdays when we first moved to a work from home world, um, you know, I won't have to create anymore. I'll be able to do all this multitasking. The average workday is actually lengthened for most people. Um, they're sending more emails than normal. They have more organized meetings um, required, um, often on Zoom. And so that workday is actually starting to stretch. And I think this is reflected especially strongly in uh, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, um, and those of us who have kind of struggled to create the boundary between um, our home and our work. So I'll get you guys to hop into the chat one more time with this check-in. How are we doing working from home? So this is a safe space. You can be honest here. Uh, a means I love it. I'm thriving over here. Uh, working from home is the best option for me. Um, B saying it's taking a bit of a toll on me, especially now if we're getting into over a year of working from home. And then some of us saying not great. Do I work from home or do I live at work? Just really struggling to have that boundary. Shayla saying back and forth between A and B. Molly saying A, Jolene saying A. It's great to see, and um, it really depends on the type of work that you do as well to see if you're able to transition pretty easily. Um, I feel the same, I can work from home, it's pretty easy for me to work from home, but I do miss going into the office and that social interaction when I can have it. Um, and so I think we it's really reasonable to kind of um, bounce back and forth or to be saying now, it seems to be taking a little bit of more of a toll on me, um, especially recently. Thank you guys So saying, I was gonna say I love it, but I do have struggles, that is so, so common. A and B, but I miss people. A is saying maybe getting a little too comfortable at home. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you guys and thanks for hopping into the chat. It's a good reflection just to check in with ourselves as well. You might even feel a little different on a Monday versus a Friday, but kind of having this like baseline that you can check in at. And this is where mindfulness comes in. And so um, some of the types of research that we have in this space, especially when we talk about kind of short practices. So 10 minutes of daily mindfulness meditation decreases future oriented worrying or anxiety, increases focus and boosts mood. And we also know there's a curriculum called mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a pretty well-established eight-week program um, that has found consistently that there are lasting changes in brain regions associated with memory, sense of self, empathy, and stress. And so I'll ask you guys just to pull out a pen and paper. Um, if you have it close by, you can always type it out on your phone as well. Just a quick 30 second um, reflection here and you don't need to share with the group. This is just for yourself. Um, who is impacted by your stress? Those three people or those three groups, probably whoever popped into your mind first um, is a great example for you. I'm gonna take a sip of water here as you guys um, reflect on that. And um, sometimes we we are just running through life so quickly that we don't even get a chance to kind of slow down and, and reflect. And so that's the opportunity we have here. And so we always ask this question as a part of our presentations as, again, a moment to reflect, to just check in, um, thinking about your own stress levels and how that impacts others around you. But I love to ask the question after this, and this is a good check-in, and it's especially a very good check-in for those of us who are um, in caregiving positions, and this is often um, disproportionately women. And the question that I like to ask is, did you put yourself on that list? And so if we were in a room of people, I would have you guys raise your hands. I would say that I have seen about 20 or 30% of people put themselves first on this list or on this list at all. Um, a good reminder, of course, that especially when we talk about self-care today, that um, self-care starts with us. And so the stress reduction starts with us. And um, if we are in a caregiving position, we are often um, 
we put ourselves low on the list or not on the list at all. Uh, Angela's saying she put herself, but she was third. And so great examples here, guys. Um, if you don't have yourself on that list, just to do a quick little like indent and put yourself on there. Of course, the ability for us to manage our own stress, um, manage our own mental health and physical health is uh, actually the closest and the most direct impact we can have and managing our own personal stress as well um, as well as our own self-care strategies is the way that we'll be able to support those around us um, even more and more impactfully wonderful so I'd love to ask the question, how do you know when you're feeling stressed? And I love to ask this question because there's some um, answer that I see over and over and over. And the reason it's nice to reflect on how do we know when we're feeling stressed is um, whatever this kind of indication is, sometimes it's mental, sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's behavioral, uh, can paint a pretty good picture for us in terms of what's a leading indicator of if we're feeling our stress level is too high. Uh, stress level of too high is of course um, leads to some of those symptoms that we took a look at earlier. So Molly saying don't sleep well, headaches, headaches and not hungry. So there's a couple of very interesting kind of polarizing symptoms that I'll hear a lot. Sometimes people will say that they can't sleep, uh, insomnia, or they are sleeping too much. You know, they're clocking 12, 14 hours of sleep um, and still feeling exhausted. The same thing will happen with uh, appetite. A lot of people saying they crave sugar, fat, salt um, as an aspect when they are stressed. And then uh, some people, this has never happened to me before, but some people saying they lose their appetite. Uh, and so very interesting to see these kind of um, both negative but polarizing types of symptoms. And it just shows that stress impacts each and every one of us a little bit differently. Feeling overwhelmed, Angela saying not having peace, not having maybe that um, ability to just take a deep breath in and out. Uh, things like high blood pressure, more scatterbrain, short temper, heart racing. So very interesting to see kind of that balance of mental and physical indicators as well. These are ones I see all the time over and over and over in ability to focus, which was brought up here a couple times, physical aches and pains, low mood, irritability, and procrastination. Procrastination is my stress response of choice. Uh, what that looks like for me is normally I would start work at 8.30. Now I think, oh, 8.30 rolls around. Maybe if I just like threw in a quick load of laundry, then after that, I'll feel inspired to start work. Or maybe if I just go on social media for a bit. Maybe if I watch a quick video on YouTube, then I'll feel, um, you know, this uh, motivation will kind of like rush in and I'll be ready. Um, and we know just how much of a um, rabbit hole this can send us on. And so being aware of our own stress responses uh, personally and how it impacts us personally is kind of the starting spot for us to be able to uh, notice and then act towards um, supporting our self-care in times of stress. Wonderful. So um, we have reached it to our self-care session. And so the one thing I want to say about self-care before we get started is do not let self-care stress you out. That is the opposite of what we're going for. Um, but I do think it's really important to share this because if you do a quick, um, I think self-care as a term gets really thrown around a lot. And if you do just a quick Google, like what is self-care? What should I do for self-care? You're going to find lists like this, 85 self-care ideas, these massive, massive lists on Pinterest, 100 strategies to help you practice self-care, maybe 134 activities. And when I see this, this actually stresses me out even more. Um, so my invitation for you would be to think of these lists as brainstorming lists, but not as to-do lists. Some things will work for um, some people and some things will work for other people. And so you'll just be picking what makes the most sense for you here. You can always try out different things, but don't let self-care stress reduction stress you out. I do want to talk about self-care just very quickly, kind of in the, I think the social media version of it. So this is what we often see uh, link to ways to practice self-care. So, you know, get your nails done, have this beautiful bath. Maybe you'll become an artist all of a sudden. You can paint outside. Maybe you're like a yoga teacher. And um, I do think these are uh, ways for us to practice self-care. We also have some other, maybe a little more destructive things that we can think of as self-care activities. If we did them prolonged, that's like kind of watch whatever you want, binge watch everything on TV, eat whatever you want, um, do some online shopping to kind of uh, keep stress at bay. And so what I would suggest is these are all forms of self-care. Um, but 
they're not the only way. And so this actually paints a fairly narrow picture again of um, what self-care could be. It's not accessible for a lot of people. In many ways, it's very expensive. And so there's other kind of less sexy, maybe less um, social media E forms of self-care as well. And I think it's really important to point out that these are also forms of self-care. So I've got a little list here going things like uh, vacuuming, cleaning up the space that you spend your time in, making a healthy meal, responding to that one email that's been driving you crazy, doing the dishes, taking your medications as prescribed, going outside, taking a shower, paying your bills, getting nine hours of sleep, decluttering a room in your home, disconnecting from social media, putting your phone away for an hour before bed, journaling, um, gratitude journaling was brought up uh, earlier as well, or even just doing something as uh, short and simple as 10 push-ups. And the reason that I really like to um, offer up this version of self-care as well is because perhaps you found yourself in this situation at one point or right now, or you've um, supported someone who's been dealing with any type of uh, extenuating circumstances or mental health issues, where something as simple as taking a shower actually is the only thing that they're able to get done on that day. Um, I can identify that with this when something that we would normally think of as simple is so, so, so challenging. And so if you don't get to becoming a yoga teacher or an artist or whatever that is um, as a form of self-care these small pieces are just as important and there's times where those will be even more important than something that maybe we would think of as is kind of um, again that social media version so even if your form of self-care feels small right now it is still self-care and is still just as important if not more important the first strategy we're going to take here when we think about um, different types of self-care is to diversify your self-care. So I have a little framework here. So those options that we we're looking at, things like binging TV, eating whatever you want, getting your nails done, those are forms of self-care. I would just lump them into a treat yourself category. And that's going to be only one of the three categories that we work with. So this is a great side to take a screenshot of if you'd like. Um, my challenge for you guys is going to be to create a self-care framework for yourself for the upcoming week. And the idea here is you're just gonna put one thing in each category. Um, so treat yourself again, that's like watching your favorite movie, bake your favorite banana bread, that type of thing. Boring then is things that we don't usually think of, clean your windows, declutter your junk drawer, pay your bills. And then productive should be something that is fairly enjoyable, just requires a little bit more discipline. So great examples there are writing in your gratitude journal, going for a 10 minute walk, planning a healthy meal for the week, that type of thing. And by diversifying our self-care a little bit, we're still doing these activities. I would suggest doing three activities per week to begin. Um, these activities that do bring us a little bit of either they're bringing us a sense of joy in the moment, they're bringing us joy for crossing something off the to-do list, or they're creating some healthy habits for us. And so each of these then just plays a different role of our overall self-care strategy. And so by diversifying them a little bit, you're getting a little bit of each. Um, you won't feel extremely guilty afterwards um, if you just focused in the treat yourself category. And you're also gonna scratch some things off your to-do list, which is uh, also brings a little bit of relief to us and is always a little sense of accomplishment as well. If you'd like, you can share something that made it onto your list. This is a really good one to revisit after this session as well. So again, you'll always have kind of that framework to work with. And then my second uh, suggestion here is called tab bankruptcy. And so I love to ask this question. I'll get you guys into the chat one more time. When we're talking about tabs, we're talking about our um, browser tabs here. And so I'm gonna ask the question, how many tabs do you currently have open? And I love seeing the answers because it's so, so interesting. Sometimes people have told me that their tabs are so small that they actually can't count them all. Sometimes people will say, um, you know, yeah, way too many. Annette saying one, that is like the dream goal. Like I can't even keep it under four. So one is amazing. Janelle saying 40, three screens, 18, six, eight, usually six. Sometimes people say they've got like eight in this browser and then like 14 in this browser. So we can really see how this type can really, um, yeah, Randy saying 21 in two browsers, can really spiral out of control. And so this is such a simple, simple um, self-care strategy. Again, it's simple, but maybe not easy. But my challenge for you then, if you've got multiple tabs open is to close all tabs at the end of the night and start fresh in the morning. The reason this is really important is um, if you're someone who consistently has these like 20 browsers open at a time, um, you're kind of 
cluttering not only are you like literally cluttering your computer but you're kind of cluttering your mind as well and so when you start in the morning if you've already got 20 tabs open the way that this makes us feel even subconsciously is we're already behind so you know you start work at 8 a.m on monday and you're like i'm already behind i already can't catch up and over time this can really start to weigh on us so i would challenge you to close those tabs at the end of the night um if for example, like sometimes people will say, um, and Janelle was saying she usually has a lot open and she doesn't right now. Sometimes it's happened to me before where my computer crashes and that's like the only way that I start with new tabs. Um, and so again, this idea of like how that feels over time and how it impacts us. And so taking this, even if it's really hard, sometimes people will say like their tabs are their to-do list, then moving that to-do list to pen and paper. I know it's old school, um, but challenging yourself to do this at the end of the day uh, and starting fresh in the morning, which is a really good feeling. Awesome. So my final tip for you guys here is to create a fake commute. And so the rise of the fake commute is something that I've been very interested in. I've been um, studying a little bit in the last few months here. And so there was a, um, an article written about this, I believe in the Wall Street Journal. And it was something that I kind of seen happen with a lot of our corporate clients who have moved to working from home. And the difficulty for most of them was finding that boundary between home and work. Um, and so even if we used to hate our commute, um, you know, even if you had to drive 40, 30 minutes, something like that, the commute actually did um, serve a purpose. Even if you are, um, maybe you drove to work, it's only 10 minutes away, or you had kind of like a little bit of a ritual before you would start working in the morning, even at a home office. The psychology behind a fake commute then, um, the commute was a historically also an opportunity for us to put a boundary between our work. And so we didn't use to have this like work for many of us seeping into our home lives because in the past historically they were very separate you kind of had this clock in clock out maybe you didn't have a laptop maybe you didn't have a home personal computer or there was no expectation that you had to do work once you got home this has of course absolutely blurred for so many of us for any of the entrepreneurs in the room um, your work maybe has is fully at home right now um, or anybody that's working from home and so this distinction between you know I start work at this time I stop at this time has been almost completely lost and so the fake commute then is an opportunity kind of for us to create a little bit of a boundary again and sometimes it really does have to be like an artificial commute so the science of a fake commute is commuting was a great legitimate experience to set up a barrier between the outside world of work family or social life and demanding your attention fake commute time is about setting up personal care boundaries, emotional oasises, and a guilt-free space and time to check in on themselves. This is from clinical psychologist Dr. Jeanette Raymond. And so her just taking a perspective on mm, maybe the danger of losing this time or this um, free time, empty time, time to clear your head before and after work, was very easily lost if we start blurring our days um, the morning, the afternoon, the evening, it's all the same. And so the fake commute then is our final strategy of the day. Benefits of a fake commute, have a few minutes of yourself each day. We may have some parents in the room, um, our caregivers in the room who have said, you know, I haven't had a few minutes to myself for 20 years, something like that, um, you know. And so finding a way to integrate this into your life the best that you can benefit, of course, of giving your break or brain at rest. Our brain isn't actually meant to really cycle and bounce around for 24 hours per day. It's really, really important that we actually get a little bit of downtime for our brain. And then finally, to create boundaries between yourself and your work. So how do we create a fake commute? Your fake commute then either, um, ideally over time, you'll have this in the morning and the evening. If you don't have any type of um, uh, kind of boundary setting activity in place right now, I would suggest starting with just one. The morning's a great time to practice this. And you're just gonna choose one or two activities to plug into your day. It becomes a part of your commute. It becomes a part of what you um, start your day with every single day in the same way that maybe you would walking or driving to work. An example here, and I'll give you guys a number of examples to plug in, um, things like I'll enjoy a fake commute before work by stretching for 10 minutes before I check my email in the morning. Really important to have the commute before you check the email. Um, I know it's really becomes a habit for so many of us that are checking our email right when we wake up. So that's a great, a great time to position it in is actually before you check your email, maybe even before your first coffee. You can even have something that mimics a uh, um, actual commute, something like walking around the block twice, going for a short walk um, and listening to music. 
So I've got a bunch of examples on here. You can always take a screenshot of this page um, as well. I've seen people have success with each and every one of these. And usually they shouldn't be anything that's, um, it shouldn't feel like, it definitely shouldn't feel like a chore and it definitely shouldn't even need to take that long. Um, and so I don't want to feel, I don't want to feel like I'm giving you guys more work. This should actually be things that you enjoy doing already. You're just actually scheduling them into the calendar here. I'll give you guys just a couple minutes to reflect on this one as well. Of course, there are tons of different strategies that you can put in place here. If there's something that you already do that's really beneficial for you, that's maybe not on this list, you can share it with the group as well. With that, we have found ourselves at um, kind of the end of the list here. I want to make sure that I leave a little bit of time for um, questions as well. So here are five things you can start tomorrow, no matter what type of role you're in. If you are a student, if you're an executive, if you are a solopreneur, um, Different ones of these will apply differently for each of us, so, but things like asking your team members what mindful activities they already enjoy, like we did um, early in this session. See if you can build team activities or benefits around them. Ensure employee mental health is a priority at a leadership level. Embrace vulnerability around the topic, opening conversations around the topic about it when you can. Starting meetings with a mini meditation like we did earlier, or even just setting the timer for two minutes of silence, giving the employee um, or team member time to catch their breath, focus on the moment, um, focus on the meeting at hand. This actually improves the efficacy of meetings as well. Making sure that you also lead by example, make these changes for yourself, take frequent screen breaks, go for a walk outdoors um, as it gets nicer here, take 10 minutes to daydream, draw, anything like that. And then um, those three tips that we covered here today, diversify your self-care for the week, close all your tabs at night, and craft your own personal fake commute. So with that, guys, we have found ourselves at the end of the session. I'm just going to lead us through maybe a three minute body scan here. This is one of my favorite practices to close the session. I know I have given you tons and tons of um, information here. So this is just an opportunity to return back to ourselves, return our uh, intention for the rest of the day, no matter what it has in store with for us. Body scan is actually very popular among uh, professional athletes. And so the reason that we do this one is to just do a quick um, top of the head to the tips of the toes, check in with the body, see how we're feeling, um, and maybe share a little bit of uh, tools to release tension. So again, I'll find my eyes closed, but that is totally up to you. Putting your soles of the feet on the floor, if you can reach. We'll start with our awareness at the highest part of the body, the top of the head. As we bring ourselves into the present moment here, it is such a joy and a privilege to be able to check in with the body. Moving our awareness to the forehead. This is an area where we tend to carry a lot of stress, a lot of strain, areas around the eyes as well. Many of us are clocking 12, 14 hours of screen time a day. This is an opportunity to just let that area, the forehead, the eyelids, the area around the eyes completely relax. As if that stress was able to just melt off of the forehead. Continuing to move down the face, focusing then on the jaw for a moment, letting the jaw hang low, releasing any clenching, and even find the lips or teeth separate if that feels good to you. Bring your awareness down the neck to the area between the collarbones and from there to our shoulders. We're gonna take this opportunity to do a couple shoulder rolls. It can be as slow as you would like, so at your own pace. That just means rolling your shoulders up to the ears and down the back. 
I'm going to do it four times here, whatever feels good to you. This actually has a natural benefit of puffing out the chest a little bit for us, um, which actually makes us feel a little more alert, awake, even a little more confident. Bring your awareness down the arms to the elbows and from the elbows to the palms. And you can just rest the hands on the top of the legs if you haven't already. If you're wondering if your palms should be up or down, whatever way they are already is just perfect for you today. There's no right or wrong way to do this. From there, we continue to move down the body, noticing that connection between the palms and the top of the legs, that natural and effortless connection between the upper and the lower body. And there, moving our awareness to the knees. The knees are a really complex part of the body, actually, but we don't pay them too much attention unless they're giving us trouble. So if your knees feel just fine today, just sending that note of gratitude to the body. Thanks for getting me from point A to point B. Feeling good, feeling healthy today. From the knees down the shins and pausing for a moment at the ankles. We can bring just a little bit of movement into the body, even just gently pushing the floor away. You'll see how that shoots energy up through the knees, the top of the legs, entire lower body. And then resting the feet back down on the floor, the soles of the feet in the connection, whether you have socks, shoes, bare feet, noticing how absolutely stable and supported you are no matter where you are right now. And just before we wrap up this body scan, reflecting once more from the top of the head to the tips of the toes, any area that can maybe use a little more love that might be a little strain that we can give a bit of a break to. When you're ready, just gently blinking the eyes back open and into the room. This is once again, just one other tool we can toss into our toolkit. There are so many body scans online and it's a really good place for beginners to start. Uh, if you're looking at kind of kicking off a mindfulness practice or seeing how to bring meditation into your life. And that's it guys. I am so happy to answer any questions you might have. I hope this was helpful for you. Um, like I said, this is a journey that I am on personally, as well as the mission of our business is to create as many mindfulness offices as possible. Um, of course, extending that to home offices now too. Uh, we do have a referral program as well. If you can think of a team, maybe it's your own, maybe it's someone um, close to you, a team that deserves a break. We have a $200 referral program. So if you refer a company, they book a session with us and um, we have mindfulness nutrition yoga everything like that um it is so so appreciated and like i said we are trying to reach as many offices as possible if you're looking for ways to kick off your own practice as well, we do have something on our website we call the 5 by 5 challenge. If you're new to meditation, you can just pop your email in there and it's a automatic program. So you'll have a five minute meditation in your inbox for five days straight. Really good way to test out a couple of different uh, strategies, types of meditation and see how to fit that into your day to day life. So again, thank you guys so, so much. It has been a joy to be here with you. Uh, I want to thank Wes, of course, and Lola for making this so easy for me um and i hope to cross paths with you guys again soon thanks so much thank you so much kayla it was a wonderful presentation i feel so at peace and zen right now um and thanks to all of you who took time out of your busy days to join us today uh don't forget to check our events page at west.ca slash events to register for upcoming webinars i see that there are no questions so i will now end this webinar but thank you so much kayla and thank you much to all of you have a lovely afternoon guys take care guys Bye.